Good morning. Good to have everybody here this morning. Welcome to Mount Olivet as we gather as a family to worship our risen Lord and Savior Christ Jesus together. Thank you to everybody that has joined us here in person, everybody that's watching us online. Good to have everybody. I hope everybody's gotten a copy of our bulletin. Uh, inside we have our announcement page. I want to run through a few things real quick if I may. Uh, again, every month our food pantry has a particular focus. Uh, the focus for this month is cereal, saltine crackers, tea bags, and canned tomatoes. So if you have some of those at the house that you can spare, or if you happen to be out in the store and want to grab some extra and bring, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, our last Advent Bible study is this Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Uh, we've been going through because of Bethlehem for the last three weeks. Our fourth session is uh, this Wednesday. Even if you've not come to any of the prior three, you want to come to the last one, do come on. It's at uh, 10 o'clock on, uh, on Wednesday. Also here in here in the sanctuary at noon is our Advent time of Lectio Divina. Uh, this will be the last one for Advent. Again, if you've not been to the prior couple, uh, come to this one. It's at noon here in our uh, sanctuary. Uh, one week from today is Christmas Eve, uh, if you can believe that. And so what we'll have going on that day is we'll have our normal Sunday morning, fourth Sunday of Advent uh, stuff, uh, Sunday school at 9, worship at 10, and then that night will be Christmas Eve service at 6.30. Uh, we'll have communion with one another. We'll do the, the candles and sing Silent Night at the end. It'll be a beautiful time. So that's what we got going on uh, next week. Uh, 9 o'clock Sunday school, 10 o'clock worship, <clears throat> 6.30 communion candlelight service. And then on Christmas Day, for those that can make it at 10 o'clock, we're going to have a service in here uh, in the sanctuary. Still got time to turn in your pledge card for this year so we can uh, be ready to go for 2024. And then two weeks from today, if you remember, we started doing this thing where on the fifth Sunday, or should I say on months that have five Sundays, that fifth Sunday is going to be a service Sunday. If you remember, last time we did it, we went out into the community, and some stayed here to bake casseroles. We did some yard work, did some singing, uh, had a good time. Uh, this time, there's going to be two opportunities for you to serve, uh, if you so wish. One, we're going to have a, a group that stays in here in the sanctuary and prays fervently for 2024. For the needs of our church, the needs of our community, needs of our state, country, and world, needs that you might bring in uh, with you as well. And the second one is, is we're going to have communion that day during our worship service, but then also bless the, the elements to, so we can have teams of folks going out into the community to take communion to our homebound members, as well as those that you might know in your neighborhood that you want to take communion to. So there's a sign-up sheet out by the main church office. If you're interested in doing that part and taking communion to folks, go ahead and sign up, and then we can start matching people up with folks who want to serve in that capacity. Uh, also in our bulletin is our uh, poinsettia uh, list as far as the poinsettias that have been given in memory of or in honor of. I want to say thank you to Kathy Sewell and the members of her uh, worship committee who got them all in here and, and displayed for us. I think it looks, uh, looks fantastic. I also want to thank the members of the Manio men's uh, basketball team who has joined us for worship this morning. Thank you, Coach, for bringing the fellas this morning. Does anybody else have an announcement they'd like to make this morning? Yeah, Thursday night was the uh, seniors' uh, Christmas dinner. It was a, it was a, had such a good time that nobody stopped to take any pictures of it. <laughs> That's how much of a good time we were having. Yeah. Anything else this morning? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer to go. Gracious and holy God, we give thanks to you for giving us this opportunity to gather with our brothers and sisters and be in worship of you. We ask that as we start to settle into this worship service that you help us to leave all of our distractions on the outside. That you open our hearts, our minds, our ears to what message you have for each of us this morning. Help us to focus solely on worship. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. And then having heard you speak to us, give us through the power of the Holy Spirit the courage and strength to do what it is you ask us to do. As we have talked about in here over the past few weeks, this season is not just a season of celebration, but also a season of preparation. 
that while we do celebrate your son's first coming, he will be coming in again. Help us, Lord, to be prepared for that second advent. We thank you for your presence here with us this morning. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside each of us. We thank you for our Savior, Christ Jesus, in whose name we say, amen. Well, friends, it's time for us to light another candle on our Advent wreath this morning. And to help us do that, I'm going to ask the Martin and Meekins families if they would come forward at this time. When God's people were surrounded by hardship, suffering, and grief, Isaiah proclaimed, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. We come today as people who are also surrounded by suffering and grief, and yet the Spirit hovers among us, tending and anointing, inspiring freedom where there is captivity, declaring blessing in places the world has cursed, and igniting fierce joy where mourning and heartache prevail. We wait as people who experience hardship and pain, yet we are called to witness to the persistent joy that sustains our life as God's people. We light these candles as signs of our shocking hope, just peace and fierce joy. May our lives shine with the fierce, tenacious joy of the light who lives in our hearts as we wait and work for the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. job everybody well friends let us now rise as one family and turn to each other and pass the peace of Christ
angels sang to lowly shepherds. Three wise men seeking truth traveled from afar, hoping to find a child from heaven. Falling on their knees, they bowed before the
must remain standing as you and I together make our statement of faith, our confession of faith. We proclaim in one voice those things we know to be true, those words as contained in our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, you may be seated. And at this time, I'd like to invite our younger disciples to come forward for our children's message. Good morning. Where are you? I, I know you're here. There they are. Parrish and Millie are coming. Good morning. Hey, Hudson. Nice job on the candle, Hudson. Let's get cozy. Merry Christmas. All right, first things first. Hey. Hey, Parrish. I like your Santa dresses. Your Santa dresses are perfect for this morning's. First off, let's say good morning to all the people watching online, because I know a whole family might be at home that are fighting off a little bug. So let's say, one, two, three, we'll say Merry Christmas, all right? One, two, three, Merry Christmas. Oh, let's try that again. One, two, three, Merry Christmas. Everybody worshiping online, all right. So, lots to do before Jesus' birthday, right? Things are happening, praying, coming to Advent parties. And we get ready for Christmas in lots of different ways, don't we? Let's see. Hmm. Who was riding through town last night on a fire truck in a bucket with a red and white suit? Yes. How many saw it? You couldn't miss it. The sirens were going. So, who has written a letter to Santa Claus? Raise your hand. All right. Who has, vi uh, who has written a letter to Santa Claus? Raise your hand. Okay. Who actually got to talk to Santa? <gasps> okay. Now we're cooking. And what did San Santa Claus ask you? A very important question. Santa Claus says, have you been, what? Good. Little boy or girl. All year long. All year long. So, how many people can raise their hand here today and say, I've been a good little person all year long? Re all year long? Uh, oh, Rodney. <laughs> oh, gee. Okay. So that, mm -mm. let's say, let's think again. Have you, I heard a mom say recently to her children, she said, I want to hear kind words from both of you to your brother and sister, kind words. Now, she could have punished them 
But instead, she offered a gentle reminder because they were making bad choices, what, what they were saying maybe to each other. And she was reminding them about kind things are better from our mouths to each other, right? So on Christmas, because we all know, we all make mistakes. We all don't do things perfectly. I'm, maybe you. Um, that Santa probably is going to show up on Christmas morning anyway, whether we've been good or bad or a mixture all year long, right? Right? Yep. So that is called mercy. And mercy is undeserved kindness. Mercy is undeserved kindness. And today's scripture is about a people in Nineveh who were very evil, wicked most of the time. And God warned them. And guess what they did? What do you think they did? Did they keep? They obeyed. And they turned from their wicked ways and they torn, turned to the face of God, just like Pastor Mark asked us every Sunday to focus during worship on the face of Jesus. And it was good news for the people in Nineveh because God found some mercy for them and did not destroy them as he had said he might. So God gives us mercy and that's the most important thing. And we are to turn from our ways or listen to our parents and teachers when they give us a gentle reminder that they love us, but they don't like what we did. And maybe we can learn from our experiences and turn away and love God even more. Will you have a prayer with me? All right. Thank you, God, for your mercy. Help us to be forgiving and to have forgiving hearts. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Well, friends, our sermon text today comes from the Old Testament prophet Jonah. We're going to be in chapter 3, taking a look at verses 6 through 10. So again, this is Jonah, chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. It says, when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. No human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. My friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. Well, my friends, earlier this very morning, I had the opportunity to give the invocation at the Wright Brothers anniversary of flight celebration they have every December 17th at the Wright Memorial. They have an event where they have speakers and they induct somebody into their hall of honor as they celebrate the first powered flight ever made by man. It's been 120 years since Wilbur and Orville did their thing. Today was the third time that I've been asked to do it, and it's an honor for me each time that I get to do it. But also each time, I always think about the first time that I did it. You see, it happened in our first year when we were serving in Camden. Now, having grown up in the Piedmont area of the state, and Heidi did too, and so did our kids, at that time, we were still trying to learn a thing or two about the weather of northeastern North Carolina. Now, we had Camden County pretty well figured out, but truthfully, the only time we really came to the Outer Banks was in July. What we now know, but didn't know then, was that though the two places are only about an hour and a half away from each other, they could not be more different in terms of weather. And when I left the house in Camden that day, it was a clear, moderate, nice day. However, when I arrived in Kitty Hawk, well, y'all know what it feels like on an overcast December morning with wind and rain whipping all up and down the beach. I did not, and I was the only one that did not, because as everyone who was slated to speak made their way up to their seats, I recognized I was the only one that not, did not have a toboggan or a hat or gloves or a scarf or an overcoat. I was dressed roughly like I am dressed right now. I have a cousin who lives with her husband and kids up in Kitty Hawk, or I guess the Southern Shores now. And she and a friend of hers brought their kids to the event. I met with them afterwards, and she told me that as the ceremony was starting, her friend said to her, look at that poor man up there shivering. (laughs) He looks just so, so cold. (laughs) Who is that? To which she replied, yeah, that's my cousin. (laughs) Certainly not one of the proudest moments in family history. My friends, I guess you could say that I wore my coldness. I wore my discomfort for everyone to see. Now, over the last several weeks, you and I have been talking about the clothes we wear. 
and how the clothes, when they are mentioned in Scripture, all point the way towards the Savior, whose birth we celebrate this time of year. And we don't just wear clothes, do we? We wear our thoughts. We wear our emotions. We wear our feelings. And it's hard to get away from them. We've been married almost 25 years now, and Heidi can tell just by the look on my face what I'm thinking or feeling. I mean, this time of year, you can tell when someone doesn't quite like or appreciate the gift they have received, can't you? Oh boy, socks, again. Whether we intend to or not, the things we feel on the inside, like surprise or shame or joy, have a way of coming through in our body language and in our expressions. I can see it written all over your face, we may say. Yes, friends, sometimes we wear our emotions. And that is certainly true when it comes to repentance. At least it should be. You see, friends, repentance is the desire when God's glory confronts us to turn away from our sin and fall into God's mercy. It is a central rhythm to the Christian life as well as an important theme of Advent. And the rhythm is this, that time and again we are brought face to face with God's good and perfect standard, the beauty and the way which brings us to our need. It humbles us to the ground, fills us with regret, and yet makes us yearn for grace, which our Father gladly gives to us in Christ Jesus. Time and time again, He receives us, bringing us back to life as we look on, lean on, and rest in His Son. And Advent itself, friends, is not just a season of celebration, but is also intended to be a season of reflection, a time when we squint our eyes and look even more intently at our own weaknesses, our own mortality, and our failures as revealed by God's law. And doing so creates an extra sense of expectation and urgency for Christmas morning. When the grace of God will arrive in flesh and blood in a newborn's cry from a back alley in Bethlehem. We see a powerful example of repentance in a strange place and with unexpected people in our reading this morning. Nineveh was a pagan metropolis, famously hated by the guy. They got swallowed up and spit out by a big fish. But they, friends, are a picture of repentance. Now, as we know, Jonah did all he could to avoid the assignment, but eventually he shows up and he preaches one of the shortest messages you will ever hear. It was only eight words. Chapter 3, verse 4, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That was it. That's all he said. Yet despite how short it was, the king of Nineveh, And all of his people were devastated by it. They believed the words of this reluctant prophet, and in doing so, they believed God. And the king and his subjects, they wanted no part of God's judgment. So let me read again what happened. It said, The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Now, friends, a little background, I think, here is necessary for those that may not know. To fast or to forego food was to admit your mortality with every hunger pang. To wear sackcloth was to wrap yourself in humility, reflective of your sinful state. And to be covered in ashes and dust was to publicly embrace the shame of your sin. And the Ninevites did this. From the throne room to the stable. From king to cow. Yes, it's 
certain translations, even the cows express repentance. I guess you could say that they were really moved by the experience. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> this was some kind of grief over sin. This was real, robust, unmistakable repentance. Faced with the judgment of God, the Ninevites didn't just feel bad. They wore their grief. More than an emotion, it was an expression. It was a hatred of sin so deep, a desire to be new so tangible, a hunger for mercy so intense that it couldn't help but be seen on the outside, to shine through the body and be communicated in their faces. Friends, what about us? When's the last time that we repented like that? When our hatred of sin was so deep, our desire to be new so tangible, our hunger for mercy so intense that it couldn't help but be seen on the outside, on our faces. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't even know where my sackcloth and ashes are stored. Friends, even though we are just as bad and broken as the worst of the Ninevites, it's probably been a while since we shed a tear over our sin, let alone sat in ash or whatever that would equal in today's time. When we take an honest look at our spirituality, I think we may even have to repent of our repentance because even in this we might fall short. But my friend, I want you to take heart because there is some joy this morning. And the joy is this. God knows it. God sees it. God knows it. And he's preparing a gift for us in response. You see, when we talk about Jesus as our salvation, most often what we want to do is just jump straight to the cross. But a significant part of Jesus' saving work was not only dying for you, but in living for you. You hear me? A significant part of Christ's saving work was not only in dying for you, but also in living for you. And it's in his living, particularly in the realities of his incarnation, that he embodies perfectly. The humility that you and I, when faced with our sin, so often fail to embrace. I mean, think about it. It's one thing for God to take on flesh and be made man, but for him to do it in utter weakness as a baby? That's incredible. He's born to an unwed girl on a cold night with little to no fanfare. He makes himself completely vulnerable, susceptible to the brutalities of this world, capable even of death. The prophet Isaiah says he would grow to be a man of sorrows in 53 verse 1. That's easy to overlook because we prefer to think about when Isaiah calls him wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace in chapter 9. We like that one. But friends, Jesus is also a man of sorrows. This is the king of the universe, embracing rejection from his own people, despised by his generation, treated as a sinner, even though he himself knew not a speck of sin. In his incarnation, in his living, in his dying, Jesus wears the humility, the weakness, the shame, the rejection, the mortality that rightly belongs to you and I. And he did so, so that we, could receive membership in the Father's family that rightly and only belongs to him. He went from the throne room to the stable. The king was born among the cows. He didn't just feel bad for us in our awful state. He joined us in it. He expressed his sorrow. It shone through his life and it was communicated in everything that he did, my friends, Jesus wore it. He wore it. This 
perfect weakness covers up our limp and lame and sometimes shallow shows of sorrow. It replaces our inadequate expressions of regret. We are free to have faith, not in our own repentance, although we should repent, but instead to have faith in Him, to have faith in Jesus, who has been perfectly humble, weak, frail, and mortal on our behalf. Seeing Christ wrapped in weakness, friends, God's aim is to lead you to publicly confess your own sin. And when does this happen? Well, at the very least, it happens here in church, doesn't it? God gathers us into his house to confess verbally, boldly, and honestly as part of our communion liturgy that we do that we are wretched sinners and we are desperate frauds. And then he causes us to respond with joy, real joy, honest joy. When you hear God say through the words of the preacher, Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. My friends, I pray that you make the most of this Advent season. I pray that you'd reflect and repent and that you would be cut to the core with grief over your sin but as with Nineveh, you are called to repent so that you might receive and rejoice in the fact that you are forgiven. And so wear that, friends. Wear that. As God convicts, let us confess. As he brings us to life with the gospel, let us celebrate. In doing so, perhaps you'll sing a little bit louder this Advent season. After all, God has gone the greatest of lengths to express how he feels about you by sending his son from heaven to earth. Now, I understand that this call to repentance during a season of celebration might feel a little awkward. But that's okay. Because Christ has already done this perfectly for each of us. And besides, if a cow in Nineveh can do it, then why can't we? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> well, friends, we come now to our time of prayer for and with one another. In every pew is a prayer request card. If you have something on your heart, on your mind, that you want our church to be in prayer for, I encourage you to fill that card out and then drop it in an offering plate when it makes its way around here in just a little bit. If it's something personal, something private, something you won't know just between you and I, I still encourage you to fill the card out, but just put it in my hand once worship has concluded. There will be a space of silence toward the end of our prayer time together, so if there is a name you want to lift aloud, a situation you want to lift aloud, a place you want to lift aloud, uh, please do so want to keep it you know close to your heart and, and keep it silent that's fine as well do know that our altar rail is always open before during and after worship if you feel called and led to come pray uh, in that fashion please uh, please come and, and do so but friends let us now put our hearts and minds together and go to the lord in prayer gracious god we come to you this morning with thankfulness on our minds, on our hearts, on our lips. As we take a look back to this past week, Lord, we see your goodness in all the ways we found moments of happiness, moments of joy. Whether it was birthdays or anniversaries or other celebrations, we give thanks to you knowing that you were there with us, and that you promised to be there with us at all times. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that what that means is that you're also present with us in times that may not be as good. Those times in which you see us struggle. Those times when our hearts are troubled. Those times when our mind is cluttered. We lean on your promises that you will be there through these times as well. And so it is trusting in your sovereignty, in your will, in your timing, in your goodness that we bring to you our 
prayers and petitions. We lift up to you all the members of this community and ask that you watch over all of us, keeping us strong in your word. We ask you to be with those who might suffer from lack of adequate housing, those that suffer from lack of food, those that find themselves struggling during what we oftentimes call one of the happiest times of the year. We lift up to you all of our military and first responders. I ask you to keep them safe as they go about their duty. We lift up to you anyone and anywhere who was persecuted on behalf of their or because of their belief in you. We have persons on our hearts and minds this morning, Lord, who might be suffering in mind, body, or spirit. And so we lift them to you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the love, peace, joy, and hope that only you can provide. We again thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside each of us. We thank you for our Savior, Christ Jesus, as we, as one family, pray the prayer that he still teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would those assisting with the offering please come forward at this time?
With these gifts, dear God, accept the praise and thanksgiving of our hearts, which rejoice in your goodness and love. Let these gifts point to your presence in the world and further your hope for the world through Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. As we prepare for the coming of your Son, may we also give our lives as a proclamation of your good news for the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, let's now turn to page 190. Put your hymnals up yet. Pull them out and turn to page 12. James tells us in his letter to not just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. So how can we leave having heard a sermon about repentance and confession and pardon and not do it? So on page 12 is our Prayer for confession. Let's all say it together, shall we? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, I do want you to hear and believe this good news. That Christ died for us while we were all yet sinners. Proving just how much God loves each and every person in here and each and every person watching us online. In the name of Jesus Christ, friends, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. We go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. 